I'm going to read just an extract from Ursula Mouse today. Uh, I know a lot of you have already read it, so thank you. Um, it's a story about social class, like Isabel said, but it's also a story about language. Uh, the main character, just for background for some of you, Jade, is trying to get data for her A-level English language coursework. And what that means is that she has to go out into the council estate where she lives, where she's from, um, and record her friends speaking and analyse their language and write an essay about it. So the story moves between kind of the story of her gathering the language from her friends and also the essay itself where she actually writes it up. And what I'm hoping to bring out is some of the conflict that she feels as she kind of finds herself trapped between two worlds, the world that she's from and the world that she's moving to um, as she kind of moves closer to university. Okay, so if everyone's ready, I'll begin. This investigation will record, transcribe, and analyze the language of young men talking about their hometown and the extent to which they want to leave it. The speakers are long-term inhabitants of one of Manchester's most deprived housing estates, notorious for high levels of crime and low levels of employment. The analysis will focus on the presence or absence of features typically associated with layers of society, which might be described as the underclass. The rain falls misty and soft as I walk down Shadowbrook Road towards Stevens. I've got the tape recorder and some paper in my bag, along with six bottles of hooch I crammed in before leaving the house. Where are you off now? Mum said, angling her head awkwardly from her place by the telly. I muttered something about college and let the door bang shut. No point trying to explain. I breathe the drip of browning leaves, the fog of airport fumes, and the wafting smells of chip pan and spliff. There's been a christening at the pub, and women wobble across the wet car park in heels and wave at me, balancing foil trays of leftover sandwiches on their hips. Through the door behind them, disco lights slide from green to red and back again and smokers slump into the comforting stink of their ashtrays. It's depressing, I suppose. Most people would see it as depressing. But what they don't see is that this land is rich. And when I say rich, I mean fertile, dark with energy. I learned about it in primary school when we did local geography another project on my world, but this one felt good. We looked at old maps and interviewed our nanas and stuff. We found out that the land used to be chopped up into allotments for locals to dig turf for their fires. And they were told to replace the top layer of peat each time. So the whole thing would grow again. Ever since I've imagined it under our feet refueling itself over centuries, humming up against the concrete crusts of its surface, smouldering under overgrown gardens, burning quietly beneath the sodden benches of the park. It throbs through us when we shout or laugh or fuck. It makes everything light up brighter than it should. I stop to fish out a cigarette, then turn onto Willow's Way where passing cars slice the puddles and headlights sparkle the rain. The questions I need to ask are troubling me. I'm not sure how to frame them in a way that's fair without digging a pit for my friends to fall into, for Stevens to fall into. 